Welcome to Fan Fave with Katrina. Fan Fave with Katrina. It's time to talk pop culture. Welcome back. I'm your host, Katrina, and this is Fan Fave, the ultimate pop culture podcast for fans of all forms of entertainment. If you love music, television, film, theater, or anything in between, you're in the right place. Two weeks ago, one of our favorite pop darlings, Ariana Grande, released her seventh studio album, Eternal Sunshine. I listened to this new project a ton, let it grow on me before I finally sat down to do this episode, sharing my thoughts on AG7 and adding it into my ever-changing hierarchy of Ariana Grande albums. So today, we'll have a little bit of fun and I will be ranking all seven Ariana Grande albums. But first, it's time for a pop recap. Let's talk everything trending in the entertainment world that I have not been able to stop talking about since I last spoke to you all. So starting off in the film industry, the new announcements that we've gotten, SNL 1975, the movie about the first season of SNL or the first night of it, Andrew Barth Feldman, Kaya Gerber, and Finn Wolfhard have joined the cast. It's just getting so good, you guys. They also just started filming the movie, and from the first looks that we've gotten, I am just getting so excited. Gabriel LaBelle is playing Lauren Michaels, and people are putting side-by-side pics of him in costume on set with, like, the actual pictures of young Lorne Michaels. And yeah, it's a great casting choice. I cannot wait to see this movie. Additional new casting news includes Noah Baumbach's upcoming Netflix film. Greta Gerwig, Louis Partridge, Isla Fisher, and Patrick Wilson have joined the film previously confirmed to star George Clooney, Adam Sandler, Laura Dern, Billy Crudup, and Riley Keough. This is such a huge cast, and the movie is described to be a coming-of-age film about adults, which sounds exactly like my brand of movie. We also learned that Bill Hader, Bo and Yang, Paul LaPel, and Sochil Gomez have been cast in an animated Cat in the Hat movie set to release in 2026. This feels like a team-up only I could have come up with, so I'm very excited for this, and I love the Cat in the Hat, so to see that they are remaking this... I feel like it has to be good, right? Now, moving on to what came out since we last spoke. Snack Shack, which is the release that I'm most excited about. I talked about it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. So if you haven't heard about it, go just check out the trailer. It's really good. Um, Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie came out on Disney+, Plus, which actually now features her performance of Maroon from the show that I attended, MetLife Night One. Also out this weekend... Love Lies Bleeding, The American Society of Magical Negroes, and the Lindsay Lohan-led Netflix movie Irish Wish. Looking ahead, things coming out this week include the Freak Nick documentary on Hulu, Jake Gyllenhaal's Roadhouse on Amazon Prime, Sydney Sweeney's new horror movie Immaculate, and the one that I'm most excited about, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire releases in theaters this weekend. One of the biggest things being talked about in film right now is the South by Southwest Festival down in Texas, where many new movies premiered, including the Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt-led movie The Fall Guy, Immaculate, which we just talked about with Sydney Sweeney, and Roadhouse with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, both of which will be out for everyone this week. And then The Idea of You also premiered at South by Southwest to raving reviews. And I talked about this one on last week's podcast episode, but it actually just broke the record for the most watched trailer for a streaming movie ever. I also want to shout out Civil War that had its premiere at South by Southwest. The Alex Garland directed thriller takes place in a dystopian version of America, and it has been described as a scary nightmare that could actually happen. So I don't know if I watched that one, but I mean, it seems interesting. And then also Y2K. That's the one that I'm most excited about. It's directed by SNL's Kyle Mooney. He was one of my favorites in the cast, and he makes really great work outside of the show as well. It's a disaster comedy film following high schoolers. If the year 2000 problem that people were so scared of, I don't know, I was born in 2000, but if this computer shutdown thing that they were predicting for the year 2000, if it actually happened, that's what this movie is about. So yeah, a lot of fun that happened down there at South by Southwest in Austin, and I can't wait to see some of these movies when they come out. Moving on to theater, Sweeney Todd has announced it will be closing on Broadway on May 5th. Honestly, this does not come as a surprise considering it seemed like one of those shows that 
I don't want to say it was dependent because it appeared to be a very good production regardless, but its star power in the leads was a huge draw carrying the show. Similar to like The Music Man on Broadway a couple years ago, where that show closed when Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster left the show. People have been speculating for a while that after Josh Groban and Anna Leigh Ashford left the show, that Sweeney would close. But then they got Aaron Tveit and Sutton Foster into the show, which only just pushed off those speculations because people were then saying, well, when Aaron and Sutton leave, that's when it's going to close. And now it's confirmed to be closing at the end of Aaron Tveit and Sutton Foster's run. So you now have until May 5th to see Sweeney Todd on Broadway. We also welcomed a couple of new shows on Broadway. The Notebook, which has been in performances since last month, had its opening night since we last spoke, and so did An Enemy of the People on Monday night. And last week, The Outsiders had its very first previous. So I'm just so excited to see all three of these shows. They are all coincidentally the top priority on my list. They're like one, two, three. But yeah, looking ahead, Water for Elephants has its opening night on March 21st. That's coming up this week, so we will be getting some official reviews on that show soon. Also, the new musical Lempika has its first preview tonight, actually. If you're listening to this podcast on the day that it came out, Tuesday, March 19th, Lempika is opening tonight with its first preview. The biggest news in theater this week included climate protesters interrupting a performance of An Enemy of the People starring Jeremy Strong and Michael Imperioli. It's interesting because apparently the show has an interactive element and so many people attending and the cast on the stage thought that this was part of the production. Neither actor actually broke character, which is pretty cool. I mean, I'd never expect Jeremy Strong to break. We've heard so many interviews about his acting style from Succession. We know he's like really big into method acting, so... I think nothing could break Jeremy Strong. But Michael Imperioli also stayed in character, taking to Instagram after the performance to say that he is on the side of protesters, but his character, Mayor Stockman, is not. (laughs) Also, Ben Platt announced he will be doing a residency at the Palace Theater. First of all, Ben is one of my favorite theater actors on Broadway. I will see anything that he does, and I might actually try to go to this concert. But second... Who would have thought that it would be Ben Platt to reopen the Palace Theater? Because for those that don't know, this theater has been closed for renovations for a while and people have been speculating about what will open it for the longest time. I mean, I heard Beauty and the Beast revival. I heard the Tammy Faye musical. I was hearing so many things, but nobody guessed that it will be Ben Platt. (laughs) So we'll see Ben Platt open up the Palace Theater. I want to see what it looks like because I've never seen a show here before. Moving on to television, let's start with The Bachelor, which I feel so silly because I really thought that this week was the finale. Like I literally bought dessert and everything. I was ready to kick back and have my own little watch party, but it was actually the women's tell all. And you guys, it was so entertaining. Like this was probably one of the more interesting episodes of The Bachelor all season. It actually kind of reminded me of when they brought out the jury in Love Island Games. If you remember that, if you watch that, peak reality television right there. And as a reminder, this is my very first time ever watching The Bachelor from start to finish. So I was not aware that this was a thing, but all of the drama for this reunion was just giving. Although it was very cute that they kind of made up at the end. I'm really loving my experience watching this show and I cannot wait to see how it comes to an end next week. The second Bachelor related thing that I want to talk about, really I don't even have much to say because I have no clue what in the world this means. But apparently ABC is working on a crossover episode between The Bachelor and the Angela Bassett led series 911. So yeah, that's happening. (laughs) To be honest, I like 911. I don't watch it regularly, but it is entertaining. It's drama filled. And if you watch The Bachelor or I guess any show on ABC lately, have you all seen the commercials for the cruise storyline? Like I need to watch, even though it may scare me, I need to. But yeah, I think that's such a cool concept of like collaborating between a scripted show and a reality show that is in its own way scripted and it probably it's probably scripted right I mean I don't know how they're gonna do it so well I did hear they were filming at the bachelor mansion though so I'm really curious the other big television thing that I wanted to mention is about Saturday Night Live because they recently announced their lineup for the first two episodes in April 
On April 6th, Kristen Wiig returns to Studio 8H for her Five Timers episode with musical guest Ray. And on April 13th, Ryan Gosling returns with musical guest Chris Stapleton. These two episodes are going to be so good. I'm literally sitting back here plotting how I am going to try to attempt the standby line for this Ryan Gosling episode because he always delivers. I mean, I need to be there. I'm manifesting like a lottery win or something. In other news, The Bear, which is currently filming season three, was renewed for season four. And in the past week, Peacock's mystery series, Apples Never Fall, released. And the musical comedy, Girls 5 Eva, was officially revived at its new home on Netflix. So I guess Girls 5 Eva does in fact have a little heat. (laughs) If you don't know that commercial, you're lucky. That commercial played every five seconds in like 2021 during the first season. And I have never not quoted it, but I am watching the show Again, because I started it and didn't finish it when it was originally on Peacock for its first season. And now I'm trying to like binge watch it and catch up to where we are now. It's really good, you guys. But I had to say that I had to quit that commercial. Coming out this week, we have the animated series X-Men 97 on Disney Plus and Palm Royale, the Apple TV comedy series starring Kristen Wiig. In music, we got a ton of new releases, including from Casey Musgraves, Justin Timberlake, Zayn, Halle Bailey, Flo Millie, Ben Platt, Cardi B, and Megan Trainer. Looking ahead, Hosier's new EP, Unheard, will be out on March 22nd. Zayn announced that his new album, Room Under the Stars, will be out on May 17th. Ben Platt's new album, Honey Mind, is out on May 31st. Perry Edwards has announced the title of her upcoming single to be called Forget About Us. Beyonce's Renaissance Act 2 is now known as Cowboy Carter. And Dua Lipa revealed the cover art for her upcoming album, Radical Optimism, which is out May 3rd and is currently being memed to death on the internet right now. In the concerts world, Wallows announced a tour. Tickets for Luke Hemmings' tour went on sale and I failed miserably at getting tickets. And then Broccoli Fest, a music festival in my home city of Washington, D.C., announced its lineup. And all these years, I've never gone for one reason or another, just never able to make it. But this might be the lineup that I definitely cancel all my plans to go for. It's just so good. I think I'm most excited about Megan Thee Stallion, Victoria Monet, and Lil Yachty. Overall, I'm just super excited for this whole music festival season that we're getting. My little fun fact, actually really sad fact, is that I've never been to a summer multi-day festival type of thing before, and it's been on my bucket list for so long. So hopefully I can go to Broccoli Fest this year, and I'm also trying to go to GovBall. But yeah, we'll see. Let me know what music festival lineup that you're most excited about on social media. Moving into our wild card section, I have a couple of things I want to talk about really quickly. The first being these letterboxed top four interviews that celebrities are doing on the red carpet. I'm very grateful that this has become a thing. It's just so fun and it gives me recommendations, but it also makes me feel a little bit behind in film in a fun way because they'll be saying stuff that I've never heard of before. And it's like, okay, I can add this to my watch list. But then it also makes me realize like no one ever ask me that question because I mean my letterbox is public but I kid you not that right now Teen Beach Movie is sitting in my top four on Letterboxd and I'm dead serious you can go check it my letterbox is that girl cat you can go check me on it I'm promising you Teen Beach Movie is in my top four so my choices would just be so embarrassing and actually it is so funny because there have been actors recently that are like embarrassed by what they say or they're just visibly flustered on the carpet when they get asked what their top four would be because that's so real that's me the other wild card thing that I want to chat about is my alma mater NYU our women's basketball team won the division three championship for the very first time since 1997 over the weekend after a fully undefeated season I really took advantage of the ability to feel very spirited about NYU sports. And that's why I'm talking about it on this podcast, because for those that do not know, we are not a big school for athletics. I never even went to a basketball game, men's or women's, during my entire four years as a student at NYU. So it was just it was a cool moment. Congratulations to our Lady Violets. Go Bobcats. I bleed purple. Woo woo. All that, you know. (laughs) Also, happy St. Patrick's Day, which was a couple days ago. I spent the weekend in New York City while enjoying media from some of my favorite pop culture Irish people. Gotta shout them out. Hosier, Paul Mescal, Niall Horan, and 
And I have to say, I know the joke is getting old, but Iowa debris. I hope you all enjoyed the holiday as well. That's all for this week's pop recap. Now let's get into the topic for today. Ariana Grande is one of my all-time favorite music artists. She got her start on Broadway in the musical 13, but I discovered her through her role as Cat Valentine on Nickelodeon's Victorious, which was honestly one of the best Nickelodeon shows ever made. Even the songs on there were so good. Towards the end of her acting career with Nickelodeon, Ariana Grande started to pivot more into a music career, and I have to shout out my dad really quickly because he would watch Victorious with me sometimes, and from the very beginning, he would always say about Ariana, like, she's the star. Like, he predicted that she would be the breakout on the show, and I would always be like, yeah, she's good, but I mean, Victoria Justice is the lead. And he was right. (laughs) Like he predicted that she would be the breakout on the show and he never fails to remind me that he was right about it. So I have to shout him out for that. Ariana signed with Republic Records in 2011 and with them she released her very first single, Put Your Hearts Up, later that year. Honestly, that song is pretty cute, but it's just not her sound at all. It's very pop, very much what you would expect from a Nickelodeon Disney star. But I remember listening to it a ton as a kid. Two years later, in 2013, Victorious concluded, and while Ariana continued to act on Nickelodeon for a short while after, it was time for her solo career to completely take off. We are now at the point where we have seven amazing albums from Ariana Grande, and as I mentioned before, today I am going to be ranking all of them. I'm going to be focusing only on her full-length studio albums, so that does not include the Christmas EPs, live album, or any random singles released in between, just the full-length albums. I also put out a call for Ariana Grande fans on social media to reach out to me and share their experiences as well, and they did. I heard back from a few, so I'll be discussing those responses on today's episode as well. Oh, and full disclaimer, my rankings are really just based on my personal opinions and enjoyment of the album, so not necessarily always her best. I know that nostalgia won with these rankings for me, so I just, a little warning that my favorites may be your least favorites and my least favorites may be your favorites, but it's all in good fun. So let's get into my little rankings. Honestly, it was very hard to choose which album got the bottom spot because unlike some artists, there's really not even an Ariana Grande album that I like dislike. But I ultimately chose Positions for that seventh place spot. It just, it's the one that slipped through the cracks for me, I guess. And maybe it has to do with the fact that it came out in 2020. Like, let's just blame the pandemic. But it also came out after what I feel are two of Ariana's best projects. And it just didn't hold up as well compared to those, in my opinion. Ariana released Positions on October 30th, 2020. The album features collaborations with Doja Cat, The Weeknd, Ty Dolla Sign, and Megan Thee Stallion, and it granted Ariana her fifth number one album on the Billboard 200, and it got a nomination for Best Pop Vocal Album at the 2022 Grammys. This is one of Ariana's more R&B leaning albums. You can definitely hear a lot of the influence while still paired with some really upbeat tracks. Even though I ranked it last, there are still a lot of really great songs in here, but it does have more tracks that I skip on the regular in comparison to the other albums that I've ranked higher. I will say though, it's silly that I ranked this last because one of my all time favorite Ariana Grande songs like ever is on this album and I'm talking about POV, which is just, it's so good, like everything about it. It's probably my favorite, I don't even know if it's fully a ballad, it's kind of like it's got a little more umph to it than like a slow ballad. It's it's really cute, you know? Like it could be a wedding dance song. It's, I love it so much. Other songs rounding out my top 5 include 3435, The Remix, Obvious, Just Like Magic, Safety Net, Nasty, Motive featuring Doja Cat and Worst Behavior. And yes, I know that's more than 5. I guess I broke my rule. But other songs on the album did fall a little bit flat for me, like Shut Up, West Side, or Off the Table, which is probably my least favorite song that Ariana Grande and The Weeknd have done together because they've done like multiple songs. This is probably my least favorite of theirs together. Like I said, though, it's not a bad album, but minus my favorite songs, it's probably the album that I've listened to in full the least. So when I was putting this ranking together, it just had to go last. In sixth place, I have Yours Truly. This is Ariana Grande's debut album released on August 30th, 2013. She worked on this album for three years and in an 
an interview with MTV News, she described it as half a throwback and like very familiar feeling, and then half of it being something that she created that's sort of special and unique and refreshing. Okay, I love this album a ton, obviously. I literally remember buying it on iTunes on my iPod Touch in the sixth grade, the very first day it came out. It so was the soundtrack to my 2013, 2014 years. It's nostalgic gold. The reason that I did not rank this album higher is because when you hold it up to the rest of Ariana's discography, it's not necessarily that it's not as good, but it's just not her sound. And I don't think it's a good representation of her artistry. Like I said, with her first single, Put Your Hearts Up, it still is very like Nickelodeon, you know, like little teeny pop star type of vibes. And she's just starting out and it's a lot of fun. But because of all the groove that she does have as a musician and a vocalist after this project, I just couldn't rank it higher. As I'm doing with each album, I'm going to share my favorite tracks, although not necessarily ranked, I guess. In my top five for yours truly, I have Honeymoon Avenue. Obviously, the album opening song, it's just so good. And she somehow made it sound even better on that live performance that she did with the orchestra last year for the 10 year anniversary of this album. Also, Almost is Never Enough, which is still one of my all time favorite collaborations that she has ever done. It was with Nathan Sykes, and I was a One Direction fan back then, but I was also very big into The Wanted. I don't know if people on Twitter acted like it was taboo to like both of them because they were beefing, but Nathan Sykes was in The Wanted, and he was my favorite. And so him and Ariana collaborating was like the best thing ever. And I think this song was actually for a movie, if I remember correctly, like The Shadow Hunters. I know there was a show after the movie, and the movie is based off of a book but I never watched any of it. So I'm not sure the context and how the song relates to that, but it's just such a good ballad that I think deserved way more success than it got. Other collaborations rounding out my top five, I would say are The Way featuring Mac Miller, which was the lead single and will forever be a classic. Right There featuring Big Sean is another really good collab. And then I'd also throw Piano in there to round out my top five. It was definitely one of my most listened to songs in middle school. It's just so fun and catchy. Like the melody, I'm not going to even try to sing it like I have sung stuff on previous episodes. You're not going to catch me singing, attempting to sing anything Ariana Grande on here. But If you know the song, you know that melody is so catchy. I'm really realizing now that it's really hard to just pick five songs off of each album because especially with this album, you literally have popular song with Mika, which is so full circle now that Ariana is actually Glinda and Wicked. Like she did a Wicked song on her debut album. And here we are 11 years later, she's about to have a movie come out where she's playing Glinda absolutely full circle. And then we have Tattooed Heart and Better Left Unsaid. Those are two other songs that I absolutely love on this album so much. There's really not even a skip song on here in my opinion. I think listening now versus when I was 12, some songs do feel very bubblegum pop, I'd say, like Baby Eye, which I mean, it has R&B influence in there, but something about it is just very poppy and maybe even loving it too. But this is still such a solid, fun pop album that is very 2013, if nothing else. Uh, Like, even if it's not the Ariana that we really know now and it isn't as much R&B as she leans into later, it's still a really great project and will always be one of my favorites. Like I said, it was literally the soundtrack to my middle school years. And for that, it will forever be special to me. Moving on to fifth place, Dangerous Woman. It's Ariana's third studio album, which was released on May 20th, 2016. It features Nicki Minaj, Future, Lil Wayne, and Macy Gray. It's her first ever explicit album. And like the title implies, it's lyrically and thematically a lot more mature. And it was kind of like a rebellious era. It's a big step up from those first two albums. This album was also nominated for Best Pop Vocal Album at the Grammys. Also, this is like a side note because I said I wasn't going to talk about singles released in between these albums. But this album was initially called Moonlight. And in 2015, Ariana released what I thought was a very fun single called Focus. I don't know if y'all remember Focus or not. A lot of people hated on it. A lot of people never being me. And the song didn't really go anywhere. It was dropped. It never even made it onto the album officially. Unless you're in Japan, because then it was on the Japan version. But everywhere else, it was kind of pushed to the side to be forgotten. But... 
this is so random, but does anyone remember some sort of contest that she did with this song? I don't remember what the prize was, but I still have the choreo to this song memorized, like the little chorus part, because she did like a dance sweepstakes where you had to like learn the dance and they taught you it in this video. This is so random. Every once in a while, I listen to Focus and still do my little dancey dance. So if you know what I'm talking about, please let me know on social media. I cannot remember why I know it and what it was for, but I still know like the little focus on me, you know, like that's a, that's a really fun song. Anyways, it may be shocking to some of you all that I am ranking Dangerous Woman this low, but I have my reasons. While it has a lot of really good songs, I do see it as a big transition album for Ariana. Her first two albums are still very pop with that R&B influence. While I think Dangerous Woman really leans into those influences a lot more and she's starting to try to find her sound, it's just overall very experimental compared to her debut and her sophomore album. I mean, it's not a bad thing. There's trap, reggae, dance pop, a little bit of everything in there. And so that does make the project feel not as cohesive. And then with the earlier albums having that nostalgic factor for me, and then every other album after this kind of improving and that mature and really honing in on Ariana's specific sound. I just don't think this project is the best of Ariana. So while still very great, it's like she hasn't reached her peak album quality here yet. It also does have quite a few skip songs for me. So while the good songs are hits, the songs I don't really like as much kind of pull the album down on my scale. My favorite songs on this album though, they have to be Be Alright, Into You, which is the bop of the century, absolutely. Bad Decisions is another really great one, Greedy, and for some reason, Every Day featuring Future was one of my favorites back in the day when I was like 14, although I would not say so now. Now I'd replace that spot with New Better, Forever Boy, except I only really like the New Better half of that song. In fourth place, I have the forever iconic Thank You Next. Honestly, we've entered the superior tier of Ariana Grande albums, in my opinion. While making this episode, I probably swapped the order of this top four at least five or six times. Literally, if you walked up to me after this episode is out on Tuesday, I may just recite these four in a completely different order. That's how hard this ranking was from this point on. Thank You Next, however, is probably my most played Ariana Grande album in conjunction with another one coming up further in our countdown. Thank You Next is Ariana's fifth studio album. It really serves as the big sister, I would say, to Sweetener. There's so much to love about this album, including the fact that the music videos from this era are probably some of Ariana's best music videos that she's ever done, especially Thank You Next. That has to be my all-time favorite music video of hers. I mean, she literally references some of my favorite romance and teen movies of all time. I think this album is a lot of fun with upbeat songs that even sometimes lean more hip hop, but the project also still manages to cohesively pull together a more vulnerable sound with the lyrics. Because similar to Sweetener, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, a lot was going on within Ariana Grande's personal life during the time that this album was being written, including the calling off of her engagement with Pete Davidson and the very unfortunate passing of Mac Miller. The lyrics really take you through those struggles and experiences in songs like Fake Smile and Ghostin, but overall this album, it's put together clearly with grace and maturity. Thank You Next is Ariana Grande's best-selling album, and it was nominated for Best Pop Vocal Album and Album of the Year at the 2020 Grammys. My top five on this album is probably Imagine, Bloodline, Bad Idea, Fake Smile, and Seven Rings, because that's just such a fun song. I think that's a pretty solid top five. I think that's my first time nailing five. So there you go. Okay, we've made it to the top three. Third place goes to My Everything, Ariana's sophomore album. Wild card, I know, right? I feel like most people, they throw this album to the bottom of their rankings. I'm convinced that people that don't like My Everything were not there. Like you had to be there. It's like the air was different. The vibes were different. We still had Vine then. Nostalgia is winning here, you guys. I'm sorry, but I was a stan for this album. Like, I am not playing. My Everything was released on August 22nd, 2014. By the way, you guys, I know I haven't really been talking about the production team behind a lot of these albums, but you guys, Max Martin, Benny Blanco, Ryan Tedder, Zed, David Guetta, 
all behind this album. This album also features collaborations with Iggy Azalea, Zed, Big Sean, Cashmere Cat, Childish Gambino, The Weeknd, I'm Not Done, ASAP Ferg, Jesse J, and Nicki Minaj. So in other words, super stacked. Now, you guys, is this album the most cohesive? No. But does it have any skips? Also no. I've never gotten the chance to see Ariana live, but if you gave me a time machine and said I could choose a specific era to go to one of her concerts, I promise you it would be this one. And like many other Ariana Grande albums, My Everything was nominated for Best Pop Vocal Album at the Grammys, and it should have won. I think my favorite songs on this album, Why Try, Be My Baby, which is the Cashmere Cat collaboration, Love Me Harder, which is the superior collaboration between Ariana Grande and The Weeknd, also Just a Little Bit of Your Heart, the ballad written by Harry Styles, which fun fact, I have heard Harry Styles sing this song live, but not Ariana. Best Mistake featuring Big Sean. Back in the day, I used to feel like Ariana and Big Sean collabs were the best thing ever. And this one is a step up from their collaboration on Yours Truly. I just love it so much. Also, Break Your Heart Right Back featuring Childish Gambino, which this one was my favorite back then. And I think it's still my favorite. I don't know if it would have worked as a single or not, but I definitely think it would have been a great one. It samples Whitney Houston and the rap is so much fun to do. I just think a lot of the collabs on this album are really great. I know some of the more iconic collaborations are like Break Free featuring Zed. By the way, his early 2010s dance hit era was unmatched. Also Problem featuring Iggy Azalea. And then we have Bang Bang featuring Nicki Minaj and Jesse J. Pop culture staples. Like you cannot deny the impact of my everything. It's timeless. And if you like to have fun, you should have this album higher in your rankings. Moving on to number two, it's our newest darling, Eternal Sunshine. Maybe it is still growing on me. Maybe I'm not bold enough to put it as number one yet, but this is a fantastic Ariana album. Ariana's seventh album was released just two weeks ago on March 8th. I think this is probably Ariana at her very best. I mean, she has really mastered and matured her sound, delivering bops and slow jams left and right. It's really a cohesive project that pulls together pop, R&B, and even house music. The album comes at a time in between her recent divorce with Dalton Gomez and her new relationship with Ethan Slater, and the album title, inspired by the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, paired with the thematic nature of the lyrics, really paint this picture. The new album is already doing really well, having achieved the record for the most single-day streams for an album this year so far. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 chart and is the largest U.S. sales debut of 2024. It's still super early on, so I feel like my favorites are constantly changing, but my current top five is probably Supernatural, The Boy Is Mine, which is inspired directly by the Brandy and Monica song of the same name, True Story, Bye, which should totally be a single, and Ordinary... How did she say it? Ordinary things. I'm sorry. Ordinary things featuring Nona. This is such a solid album though. I love it so much. And like coming off of Positions, which was in last place, this really reestablished my love for Ariana's current music again, since her last album wasn't really my favorite. Eternal Sunshine is just so groovy. Come back to me in a year and this might be number one. Our number one for today, though, is Sweetener. My analytics on Tidal have yet to recover from this album release. I'm so serious. It's still, like, heavily dominating my most all-time listened-to playlist that they generate. It's, like, 100 songs that you listen to the most. But, like, since I've had Tidal, which was, like, 2018, I still have songs from this that are on here despite five or six more years of music coming out since then. Sweetener was released on August 17th, 2018, and it gave Ariana her very first ever Grammy Award. It won Best Pop Vocal Album at the 2019 ceremony. This was the soundtrack to my senior year of high school, and it included features with Nicki Minaj, Missy Elliott, and Pharrell, who also produced some of the songs on the album. This is when I feel like Ariana really started to flourish in her own sound. The songs in this album, a lot of them are very light and fun, with trap and dance pop influences, while other songs do contain important messaging, like Ariana's struggles with anxiety. 
This was her very first project after the devastating Manchester bombing terrorist attack that happened at her show, and her song Get Well Soon features a very touching tribute to the fans who lost their lives. All in all, this album just feels so refreshing and really solidified the new mature sound of Ariana's music coming out of that Dangerous Woman era. I think my favorite songs in the album are probably R.E.M., Every Time, Breathe In, Get Well Soon, the title track Sweetener, and the lead single No Tears Left to Cry, which may be my favorite lead single that Ariana has put out off of any album ever. I'll also take this opportunity to say that I actually do like the song Pete Davidson. I know it's a little bit divisive among the Ariana Grande fans, but I'm telling you, if the song has a million fans, then I am one of them. If it has 10 fans, then I am one of them. If it only has one fan, then that is me. And if it has no fans, that simply means I am no longer on this earth. And I mean that both in this song and Pete Davidson himself, since we're on the subject. One of my favorite ex-SNL cast members now, I guess, and his song or the song about him is very good. I also don't think I really love the song The Light Is Coming, but I have to shout it out specifically for Nicki Minaj's rap because I still quote it on the regular, especially the part where she's like, sips tea and it's unsweet. (laughs) Because one thing about me is I love sweet tea, but I've been trying to cut back and get on a diet because I drink entirely too much of it. Like the way that people are about coffee is how I am with sweet tea. So sometimes when I'm being healthy and I go and I get an unsweet tea instead of a sweet tea, I tell whoever I'm with like, sips tea and it's unsweet. (laughs) But anyways, that's so silly. Uh, How could I truly pick a favorite on this album? Like it's so hard. Every song on here is just such perfection. Sweetener is an instant classic from Ariana Grande. So those are my rankings, but I also asked you all, my fellow fans of pop culture, to let me know on social media what your favorite Ariana Grande album is. At Shay's Backyard on TikTok says, the best album is definitely AG7, Eternal Sunshine. Every album gives listeners a different side of Ariana, and this one is the most beautiful. Yours truly is such a cute album, while Thank You Next shows pain, but Eternal Sunshine seriously is off the charts because of her new matured voice, thanks to Wicked, and the beauty and learning to work through all of the pain she's endured. It gives viewers a more human side of her and feels completely vulnerable and true to her. Her happiness and her growth shines through in the whole album. That's a really beautiful message from At Shay's Backyard on TikTok. I think I definitely agree. Like I said, Eternal Sunshine is already like risen to the top of my rankings. I also think it's really interesting that you mentioned Wicked because that's true. She did record and write this album kind of like in between the process or like after doing the Wicked movie. So I think that's pretty interesting as well because I know she said at first she wasn't going to do an album because she was so focused on Wicked and I guess with the strikes and everything she had a little bit more downtime and she was able to make this album and it's so good. I'm so glad that she did. Over on Instagram, I heard from my friend Shakara, and it's so funny. She said, how can I choose when her entire discography is perfection? You guys, I have to shout out Shakara. She's been on the podcast before. She's one of my friends from like real life. We went to school together and everything like that. And she actually is probably the biggest Ariana Grande fan that I've known. Like she's been to every single tour since I remember here. She played the Fillmore in Silver Spring for her like first tour, Yours Truly, that era. She's been there every single tour. She knows like every single song like Ariana is her favorite artist so it makes sense that she would send me a response like this because like she's right I mean for all of the good music that Ariana puts out it really is hard to make a ranking like this I also heard from Anissa on Instagram who says it's so hard but sweetener most of my favorite songs in her discography are on there better off every time good night and go get well soon it cannot be beat for me but eternal sunshine is creeping its way up there with every play it will probably take me a few months before I can really place it okay I think I'm just like Anissa I mean my top choice was sweetener as well and then I put eternal sunshine at the number two and I was literally like eternal sunshine is so good but it's so new that I'm not sure if I could put it as my top spot but yeah sweetener it's such a top tier album and anisa you listed off some of my favorite songs on the album so yeah really interesting stuff there hearing from some fans of ariana grande to see how my opinions matched up with your opinions if you haven't reached out i posted a video asking for ariana grande fans to share their opinions i'll also be posting polls throughout the week on my instagram since this episode is now out so it's not too late for you to let me know what your favorite ariana grande album is or what your favorite song by her is or just 
just why you're an Ariana Grande fan. So let me know on social media because I want to hear from you. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, tell a friend and make sure you let me know by leaving a review and following the podcast. As a reminder, at FanFave, it's all about the love for entertainment and the joy of being a fan. FanFave is active with even more content on social media, so make sure you don't miss anything. It's at FanFave Media everywhere. So connect with me because I want to hear from you, my fellow fans of pop culture. I'll see you next Tuesday when we'll dive into another aspect of pop culture. Thanks for listening and see you soon. Mm-hmm.